We are born free. And we will die free. The time in between, though, that's complicated. In that time, governments, institutions, and our egos will limit our ability to find true freedom in this life. These are real stories of real people overcoming the odds, persevering in justice, and unlocking their potential. Welcome to Finding Freedom. Here's your host, John Oderman. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Finding Freedom right here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. And really, really excited for you all to hear today's episode. I have a uh, a recurring guest, uh, Vin Armani, also known as Cyprian, is back on the show. We're going to be talking about an extremely, extremely important topic. Uh, We'll be talking about something happening in Ukraine. Uh, Volodymyr Zelensky recently, within the past uh, week here, 10 days, has proposed a ban on the religion, Russian Orthodoxy, within Ukraine. And we'll get into exactly what that means and specifically how that breakdowns in the greater scope of of orthodoxy as a whole, as Cyprian is a is an Orthodox, is an Orthodox Christian. So we'll get to all of that. Very fascinating stuff, regardless of if you are yourself a Christian or not. A very, very important episode um, when it comes to religious freedom, when it comes to, to freedom as a whole. And this show is called Finding Freedom, so we're going to dig into it. Before I introduce Cyprian, I just want to remind you that we have a special going on right now in the Lions of Liberty Pride. In order to join the Lions of Liberty Pride, you can do so um, if you join with an annual membership through Patreon. You can save 15% off. That is double our normal savings on annual membership. That works for upgrades as well, and it works at any level. So go to patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty. And if you want to go annual, you save 15. Don't have to. You can also do the monthly and uh, and uh, and sign up that way. Would love to have you sign up through Patreon, or if you want to go at locals, go to lionsofliberty.locals.com. Let's get into today's show. Okay, we are live here with Cyprian, also known as Vin Armani, and uh, actually the last time uh, Cyprian was on the show, uh, we kind of got into a little bit. On the backstory on his uh, his name change, which I think was was pretty interesting. So, yes. um, if you want to go back and and check that out, that was episode three oh five, I think. So, I guess almost a little over a year ago is when we uh, last spoke. So, good to have you back, Cyprian. Hey, great to be back. Yeah, and I mean, the last time we talked, you know, I, I remember I, I can kind of almost trans- transport myself back to it. Um, you know, it was it was during the obviously the in in the height of the you know the the COVID vaccine madness when you know people were losing their jobs and you know I, I had a had, had a threat with my employer that you know that that I might be you know they might try to force me to get vaccinated which I, I then would have left my job and I think we I think I ended up titling that show finding your fighting position um, mm-hmm. you know and as you've talked about a lot. Um, you know, they need to position yourself geographically, but also in other ways, in a way that you're that you're able to fight. And, you know, I think it's it's interesting as, you know, things have obviously changed a lot in the last year. But, you know, as we you know, as we look at what happened and, and things kind of flipped like a switch from covid to the Ukraine. And, you know, now we find ourselves many uh, you know, many months later into this Ukraine war, and it's coming out that now the the president of the Ukraine or of Ukraine, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, is I, I believe it's just a proposal right now, but I, I think it's assumed it's going to go go into effect mm-hmm. uh, to ban Russian Orthodoxy. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just it's insane to even say that out loud to hear it. But um, let me just first. Get your thoughts on when when you saw that proposal. When you saw that that was 
that was going to happen. Um, what were your thoughts? Um, it was not. It was not surprise. So certainly, in the the circle of people that I am around, the my spiritual father, Father Turbo Qualls, uh, the conversations that we've had both privately and publicly, um, the last three years, much of the church has understood the last three years to be fundamentally uh, an attack on on the church as all manifestations of antichrist have been forever um and so this has been seen as a manifestation of antichrist um i think that it's there's a very interesting and notable thing here that it does seem that everything why does everything always end up with let's close the churches why does everything mm. always end up with the churches need to be closed that was the, right? yeah, the first thing with COVID. Close the churches. We've got to close, close the, the churches. churches. Yeah. And I think that this is a this is very much a like eyes to see, ears to hear sort of situation where it's like, mm, I bet I, I guarantee you that the solution for the climate change thing is also going to be close the churches. I can guarantee you. Ooh. I can guarantee you, because at the end of the day, all of that is just noise that. The struggle is what the struggle has always been, what it's always been. And so, and I think that seeing that and understanding that and really being presented in a very visceral way where you're just like, how long are you going to deny that this is about the church? How long are you going to deny what the real struggle is? Like how many times, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because, mm -hmm. and, and I think that, that in and of itself has been a huge catalyst for a great many people who have not been otherwise religious mm -hmm. for most of their life to within the last three years become not only religious, but for the most part, what I've seen is a move toward traditional Christianity in the West. So whether that's sort of traditional Roman Catholicism and returning to those kinds of roots or I think even more pronounced because it just it's it's like it came, it seems like it came out of nowhere a move toward orthodoxy eastern mm -hmm. orthodoxy in particular and yeah the so you know I think that we can get into a little bit about talking about the context of this of 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 what Zelensky is doing and what it means uh but if you know, I will get I can paint in some pretty broad strokes about like kind of historical context, little bit of theological context. But I mean, to start this out, you know, what I do want to say is I start to, if, as I start to talk about this, because um, I am Orthodox. Um, I was brought into the Serbian Orthodox Church, however, and um, Serbia right now, in terms of all of the parties there is still kind of cool with everybody. So it's a it, it's a view from the outside in, um, you know, it's kind of like you're talking about somebody else's family in this case. So this is definitely there. There's this is a family issue that's that's taking place. Um, it's a big issue that stretches back for centuries. Uh, I don't speak Russian. I'm not a scholar of either Russian history, nor am I a scholar of the church. So I can paint with some pretty broad brushes, uh, with a pretty broad brush. Uh, people, can, please forgive me if I get certain small details wrong a as we talk about this. I want to say that up front. I'm going to try to stay away from like, you know, really getting into kind of the theological stuff because that's out of my wheelhouse, right? I don't want to get above mm -hmm. my skis. But I think that we can have a, a productive discussion uh, and give some people at least a, a basis to start to understand how important this is. Yeah, like this is in it's it's the most important development that has happened in the Ukraine war. By far, there's nothing more important that has happened. It's it's an attack on on the ancient faith, right? And you know, just mm -hmm. just to paint, you know. You know, and you're painting with it with a broad. You're going to paint with a broad brush. I'm going to paint with an even even broader brush because I know even even less about it. But you know, I don't know how familiar people are with you know the 
the different faiths, the different religions in in Ukraine. And I, I really wasn't until I started researching a little bit, but almost 70 percent of people in Ukraine identify as East, East, Eastern Orthodox of, of some type. Um, I think the numbers I have here, roughly you know, 28 percent are the uh, the Kiev uh, Patriarch Kate mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think there's a large group, almost a quarter, that simply identifies as as Orthodox, mm -hmm. probably for different reasons. I'm, I'm sure there's you know some some different reasons for that. You know maybe not wanting to get lumped in with, with one group or the other. Mm -hmm. um, there's twelve twelve point eight percent that identify with the with the Moscow Patriarchate. Mm -hmm. So it's th this is this is big. I mean to put this in perspective, you're talking about. You know, twelve percent of the population. And that's not even you know taking into account for those who are just identifying as Orthodox. Mm -hmm. You know that that's tantamount in the United States to you know outlying Catholicism. It's, I mean, it's 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 close, bigger, right? No, no, it's it's far larger than that. It's far yeah. it's far bigger. So so let's so first let's just lay out a few like sort of things about this because I think for us in the West. We can have a misunderstanding when we look at these things about, mm -hmm. you know, different religions, even as you said. So the first thing to understand is these are all the same religion. All, Christi no all Christianity. No, 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 yeah. no, 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 no. All the same religion. Right. So like if we were talking about, mm -hmm. I mean, these are all the same religion. In other words, if you're baptized in, in one of these by a priest mm -hmm. who associates with one of these, all of the rest recognize that baptism as valid. They recognize your chrismation as valid. You are part, they are part of the same church, right? So the church, mm -hmm. they are all a part of the same church. This is the exact same, it's the same religion. What we're really talking about is we are talking about jurisdictions. Okay. Okay. So the better way to really view this is like in the Catholic church, you would have the archdiocese of, Orange County in California, and you would have the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Okay. Okay. So when we mm -hmm. talk about the Kiev Patriarchate and we talk about the Moscow Patriarchate, we are talking about the the it's a level higher than than diocese, but we're talking about jurisdictions. Okay. And so mm -hmm. a lot of this, a lot of it has to do with the fact that the church does operate in the world, right? So there are physical buildings physical buildings that need to be taken care of. There are salaries that need to be paid. There are monasteries that need to be kept up. There are faithful that need to be um, helped, social programs. You have to operate in the world. So you have to have some institution within the world, right? And that's necessarily going to be a political institution, especially in the Orthodox world. So the other thing to understand, and I think that this is to give some historical context, is you cannot separate Russia and certainly Ukraine from the church. Like to the degree that the alphabet that is used, right? The Russian mm -hmm. alphabet, the letters, it's called the Cyrillic alphabet. So that's named after St. Cyril, who actually introduced the alphabet and the language of, of church Slavonic. So church Slavonic introduced that to the Rus people. So, like, you can't separate out, like, Holy Russia. Basically, there's been Orthodoxy in Russia since the 900s, so for over a 1,000 years. Um, the, the, church, the church coming in is, is the identity of Russia. Before that, you was basically the Mongols were in there. They were kind of subservient to the Mongols. There was some influence of Scandinavian, Slavic, and it was and it was a hodgepodge of you know various different warring kind of tribes trying to each take mm -hmm. their little section and it was all taking place in ukraine and it was through the church and the introduction of the church that the russian people at the time called the kievan rus so kievan by kiev kiev was the capital of russia um the it's the ancient capital of russia it was from there and it was the church that that gives or gave Russia, still gives to this day. I mean, Vladimir Putin talks about it. It is the church that gives the Russian people a cohesive identity. 
So that's the first thing to understand is that Ru- you let's, cannot let's, separate let's Russia from up. the church. Let's, sure. let's focus on that for a minute. So it yeah. gives them a cohesive identity. What, yes. what, is, what do you mean by that? There is no Russian people outside of the church. There is no Russian is- people outside of the church. Before the church, there was no, the area that we call mm. Russia, there was no Russian people. They did not have a, an identity where they saw themselves as in any way connected to each other. It was various tribes, basically tribes, nations, small mm-hmm. small nations and tribes, right? In all of these districts that saw themselves with different ethnicities that have had different languages. So like I say, it's even the church Slavonic that as a language gives them a common language. This is the first time the Russians have a common language even. Before that, there's no common language in all of that no. area. And that's introduced by St. Cyril. So that it is the church. You cannot mm-hmm. separate Russian identity from the church. You, it, it's impossible. Right? And that's not the year nine. That's in the 900s that that happens. But even deeper than that, when we talk about Ukraine, so that people can. So the first thing, that's the first thing to understand, right? So now you're seeing a war that's taking place in this region. That's, that's a war between brothers, right? Who. Previous, I mean, Kiev was the, Kiev is the, what will we say, the seat of the beginning of Russian identity as it's understood now, today. Begins in Kiev, right? So this region is incredibly important to a people. Like, who is in control of this region and its connection to the church is incredibly important to the to the whole identity of the people. It's it's the equivalent of the Jews in Israel. It's that it's wow. it's that deep. It's it is that deep. Right? So it's not so you can't separate this. There there are in terms of the orthodox world and this is Greek orthodox, Serbian orthodox, Antiochians, right? Even the ones in the Middle East, even the Palestinians. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, who are orthodox because there's that's or there's plenty of orthodoxy there. Um, you know, every day we commemorate saints, f- ancient saints from Ukraine. So today, as we're recording this for you, um, and yesterday for me, was uh, Pope Clement so of, of Rome. So Saint Clement of Rome, who was it's arguable whether he was the first pope, the, the first pope after Peter in Rome, or whether he was the fourth. So basically, Peter was there. He ordained two other bishops of Rome, but Peter was Mm -hmm. still alive. But the person that Peter passed the church to, holy, as he would be sit in the seat of Peter when Peter was not there, was Clement. Now, Clement, and he's considered to be, he's called one of the apostolic fathers. So he's considered to be one of these first fathers of the church who was incredibly influential, who actually knew the apostles and studied under them. So like we would call, what you would call like the first generation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he's the spiritual son. Pope Clement is the spiritual son of Peter. So this is Peter's star student. Okay, he passes Mm -hmm. off to him in Rome. He says, okay, my martyrdom is, is on its way. You will be the bishop of Rome, Pope, Papa. Right, chief among chief among equals. Mm-hmm. Now we're still in the Roman times. Clement obviously is falls afoul of he's he he's a martyr as well. He falls afoul of the the Roman emperor, and he's sent to Crimea, the Kherson, ancient Kherson, and he's put to hard labor. This is in the year like 100, 99, 100. So he's sent over there. He's put to hard labor. Um, there's a there's a story in his his. Uh, so this is today commemorated, by the way. So in any Orthodox church where wow. you are right now, if you go right now, this is the saint who will be commemorated today. So understand this: the first, besides Peter, the next guy, the first pope, was martyred in Crimea. That's remarkable. Wow. In the year 100. So he's put there. The st- so the story in his life, 
is that um, he's put to hard labor. There's no fresh water around. There's other prisoners there. Um, he, he's obviously a holy individual. He prays, and a, a, a small lamb shows up out of nowhere, just like pops and there's just a little lamb and the lamb takes off and he follows the lamb up onto a hill and the lamb vanishes and he goes up onto the hill and he's been breaking rocks. That's what he was put to hard labor, breaking rocks in a quarry. And he takes his pickaxe and he hits the ground and a spring of fresh water comes up and everybody, and everybody drinks from the water and he converts like right there, like five, everybody basically in the prison is converted. Like he converts them all. He baptizes them and converts mm -hmm. them. And for that, they say, okay, execution. They execute him by tying an anchor to his neck and throwing him into the ocean there, into the Black Sea, where the, this fight is taking place. He's martyred in, in those waters. And the people pray that they could see him again. And for centuries, ever so often, the tide would recede and his relics would be there and there, and, and there would be a... a you know, basically a, a heavenly built shrine in the sea after the, after it, and they could see him. And then that's, and there were many miracles that happened and all of that. So the first thing to understand is that it's like, that's how long Christianity in a miss in a mystical sense has been in that region from the beginning. It is Christian years. holy. Yeah. It is Christian holy yeah. land. It is Christian holy land. There are people who were bat who are there. The their blood is there who were baptized by Clement. Who were baptized by Peter's top student. Right? So this is what you have to understand that like it, for for Christians this is so important. And the fact that so now when you look at like oh there's a non-Orthodox, non-Christian leader who is doing the bidding of basically atheist materialists, mm -hmm. right? Wanting to change this and make it something different. And so now I think people could start to understand like when Russians like Dmitry Medvedev, Vladimir Putin say it's Satanism, this is a war against Christ, you can start to get a context of like, oh, this is not just let me put a Ukraine flag emoji in my bio. Like, this is important to Christians. The other thing that's very important to understand is that Eastern Orthodoxy, so all of the Orthodox people who are in Ukraine and all Russians, Rome considers them all members of the body of Christ. So Eastern Orthodoxy is a true church for Roman Catholics. So if you ban a, if you ban any of those churches that are there, you are banning the true church even by the canon. It's the canon. Even by the canons of Rome, you are banning the body of Christ. You are making it illegal. I, I, I'm so I'm this sure is a big deal for Roman Catholics. Is this, I mean, I'm sure this has happened somewhere with the, the church being banned well let's talk about it um, right because that's yeah. the historic that's the most important historical context of what we've got yeah going they, on here let's get right? into that okay because this is so this is where i'm gonna go with broad brushes because this is so complex and and sort of twisting okay if people want like the introduction to this this is the first book that when i became orthodox my godfather or maybe even before told me to get it's called chosen up, for his uh, people chosen, chosen for, his, for people. his people yeah it's a biography of patriarch Tikhon. it's written by jane swan um patriarch Tikhon. so we'll kind of start in the middle of the story patriarch Tikhon, saint Tikhon, um was the last patriarch of moscow uh, before, uh, or or let's say he was the he was the last what we would call real patriarch of Moscow before the the Soviets basically took complete control of the church. So, what is a patriarch, right? So that's important to understand because, like you were talking about, Moscow patriarchate, Kiev patriarchate. If we talk about what we've got going on in Ukraine right now, there's 
and and so let's maybe start there. Let's start where we are and we can work our way backwards. There's fundamentally three um, jurisdictions in Ukraine right now. So there is the uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Mo Moscow Patriarchate is what it's called. There is the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Kiev Patriarchate. And then there is the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. Okay, so the Orthodox Church of Ukraine is considered by many in the Orthodox world to be basically a schismatic heretic church. Um, however, really? yes. Um, however, that is the church that is recognized by um, the what's called the ecumenical patriarch. So let's talk about what a patriarch is, basically. So yeah, there's no there's no pope, and there's no infallibility or anything like that in ortho in orthodoxy. That's not that's not believed in. That's a completely Roman Catholic thing. Um, what you have is you have uh, the the holy orders. So you have, uh, you know, deacons and subdeacons and readers. And then you have priests who can actually perform uh, the liturgy and all of the sac sacraments. And then you have bishops who or ordain priests. You have a in, level in the Orthodox Church. Can, can can priests get married in the Orthodox Church? Yes. No? Yes. They can. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, and not, not an important always... question. I was just just curious. Yeah, priests could always be married in uh, Christianity. That was that's a that's a Roman a, a later Roman Catholic um, innovation, basically, mm -hmm. of, okay. of stopping priests from being married. So, um, yeah. So you've got priests, then you've got bishops. Um, now, in terms of the marriage thing, usually uh, once we get above priest, in general, those the people in those ranks, the men in those ranks, are pulled from. Uh, monastics. So in general, they are not, there's a strong monastic tradition in orthodoxy, something that's really not there in Catholicism anymore, but certainly used to be um, mm -hmm. in Roman Catholicism. So uh, generally you'll pull from monastics. Monastics cannot be married. So these are monks. Um, so these are generally, once we get at this level, these, these individuals are not married. So you have bishops, then you have archbishops and what's called metropolitans, which is a kind of jurisdictional over a large area. Uh, and then you have patriarchs who are, you might say, over a nation or over a people. So a country will have a patriarch. There's a Serbian patriarch. There's a Romanian patriarch. There's a, the patriarch of Moscow is called the patriarch of Moscow and all Rus. So Rus is the people. Right. So it's the metropolitan is kind of about an area. So a metropolitan will be about a city, a region. Mm -hmm. But the patriarch is about a people group. So you've got a Greek patriarch. You've got a Serbian patriarch. You've got a Russian patriarch, etc. Um, and then you have the most ancient sort of position, which is the, called the ecumenical patriarch. And he, the, he is basically viewed as a equal, uh, as a chief among equal uh, equals of all the patriarchs. So not like in the Roman Catholic Church, where the Pope would be no. above at the no. same level as the patriarchs, but right. over the entire church. So he's not over anybody, right? He's the chief among equals. So he's kind of mm -hmm. like the the speaker of the house, okay? Right? You could say, right? So it's not like. The speaker of the speaker of the house doesn't get you know has has power because they're viewed as a leader, but they still have the same. They're still vested with the same general authority as a as any other congressman, right? It's not right. like they get some special constitutional authority just because they're they're the speaker. There's some minor things, right, that are that are like um, logistical about like uh, succession. If somebody if you know if people die and whatnot, that they're sort of in line. Um, I'm saying in the Speaker of the House sort of situation. And that's kind of similar with the with the way that it is with patriarchs. So these are basically leaders. But um, the church, there have been various times when patriarchs do not agree with the decisions, many times political decisions that are made by other patriarchs. And so they they fundamentally break what they would call breaking communion. It's not a it's not a true schism. It's not like we've become a new religion, but they're basically in terms of their 
there are some liturgical, and this is where I'm not going to get over my skis, right? Because this yeah. is like, this is deep, sort of deep church matters here. But needless to say that it's like, it, it isn't the same as the schism that happened between the East and the West with, with Rome and Constantinople, where both of the sort of popes or patriarchs excommunicated each other, right? So they're not, these are not patriarchs ex excommunicating each other. So basically what's, what's happened in Ukraine, and this began in the 90s, was the Ukrainian, some, some would say that this really began in the 20s, and we can talk about this, but since the 90s, since the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, well, it was very clear you know, the Russian church, that was very clear. Um, it's there. Ukraine being its own entity, there's a desire for a Ukrainian church, right? Where they, they say, we're a Ukrainian people. As a people, we should have a patriarch. Um, there's There certainly is some validity to that in terms of the tradition of the church. And there's been a move that has been supported by basically like the Greek side of things to recognize a patriarch from Ukraine. On the Slavic side of things, they basically said, eh, culturally, religiously, we're basically still going to see you as part of Russia. Like you've been a part of Russia for a long, long time. Uh, so we're basically going to see you as part, of, uh, as part of Russia. And a lot of this is the fault of the Bolsheviks. Well, it's, it's interesting because, I mean, as you said earlier, that the Russians, the Russian Orthodox, are looking at Kiev, which is you know in Ukraine, as sort of the the birthplace, I guess, for lack of a better term, of of their religion. So to to well, have of, the, I, of I, the people of the people, yeah, of of, of the people of their of their identity, identity, yeah, exactly. So yeah, to see yeah, so you you can kind of see how this play out a little bit, where if they're looking to to break away and form a new identity. Um, and not just a new identity, right? But a new identity that is not Russian. Mm -hmm. And that is antithetical to Russia. Right? So yeah. like, so, so you imagine this would be like, okay, the, well, it's the Palestinians in Israel, Right. We're going to take we not only are we going to take over Palestine, but we're going to take over Palestine and be hostile to the Jews. Mm -hmm. Clearly, this is something that that Jews are like, what? can't do it. <laughs> not going to happen. Impossible. Cannot allow it to occur. Sorry. Sorry. And if you yeah. understand the conflict in Ukraine that way, if you have the historical context, you're like, oh, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> what did it? Of course. Like, yeah, there's no, there's absolutely no way. There's no way. And so this has been, you know, this is, this is what the West is playing with. The West is, has basically engaged, engaged Ukraine in a holy war. Because it is at, it is not at the level of, oh, we want some territory. This isn't about territory. Right. The idea that Ukraine says, you got to give back Crimea. You got to give back Crimea to this atheist, non-Orthodox government. And it's like St. Clement was martyred right there. What are you talking about? No, mm -hmm. you're not having this back. No, absolutely not. I can't. I can't let you have it back. Or I can't, it's not even have it back. I can't give it to you. Mm -hmm. It's not mine to give. It's mine to protect. Right? And of course, look, not everybody involved on the Russian side is, it's, it's not like a lot of people are using that as an excuse. Right? There's political aspects of this, of course. Not everybody is just so pious. And of course, right. but you can see, you can see that it's like to ignore that part of the story would be like ignoring the religious aspect of the conflict in Israel between the, the Israelis and the Palestinians. How can you? Yeah, it's the whole story. It's the whole story. <laughs> it's the whole story. So yeah. what's happened? So what's so so let's let's go back a little bit to talk about like how it gets how it gets to this point. 
So yeah, the so first off, let's talk about what's being proposed to be banned. What's being proposed to be banned is the Ukrainian Orthodox Church Moscow Patriarchate. So this is the set of bishops and everybody below the bishops who are answering to the metropolitans and patriarchs who are in the order of the Moscow Patriarchate. They actually have more bis- the most bishops in, in Ukraine. They have the most churches in Ukraine, and they have the most monasteries in Ukraine. Now, Ukraine is chock full of monasteries, some of them a thousand years old, some of them that go back to the very beginning of, as we said, the founding of the Rus, the beginning of the, the Russian people. Um, probably the most important is uh, the Kiev Caves Monastery. And there are so many saints. Almost every day you go through, uh, you know, the Synaxarion, which is like the listing of saints that are and their lives that are going to be commemorated on a given day. And you'll find a saint from the Kiev Caves. So at one time, the monastery itself was like the size of a city. It's, it's, it's the spiritual, it's really the spiritual hub of in in many ways it could be argued that it's almost a, it's that that it's the spiritual hub of uh of russian orthodoxy that may be taking it too far somebody could correct me there but i think there are probably people who could could argue with that right the hub of orthodoxy is obviously mount athos and there's a a, a giant russian monastery that's that's there on mount athos uh in greece um that has been raided uh, by this Ukrainian regime pretty constantly since 2014, on and off. Recently, and they've, it's they've, been... They've arrested or detained monks and, and priests, correct? That's right. That's right. They have they have been doing that. They've been saying that they are, um, you know, colluding with the enemy, which we'll see that this is a pattern. And there's a, re- there's a reason why Russians will be... This is a pattern. That, that Russians will recognize and another reason why they're, you know, they're not going to back down. The, the more this goes, it's the reason why it's a huge escalation. Um, so what, what Zelensky is setting up to ban is he's setting up to ban basically that institution. And what that will f- probably mean is that the churches, the property, all of that is going to be taken and given to uh, what is called the Ukrainian uh, is called the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. So this uh, Orthodox Church of Ukraine. The tree of liberty must be watered from time to time with the blood of tyrants. The official spirit of 1776. Smooth, flavorful, Merlot. For any revolution, Tyrants are losing their heads over this wine. Enjoy the taste of freedom. Drink the blood of tyrants. Order today at bloodoftyrants.wine. Save 10% with the code LIONS. Which the the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, as you said before, is only recognized, maybe not only, but is recognized by the Greek Orthodox, but not by... Russian Orthodox. Is that yes. So, so, okay. so not the Slavic Orthodox, right? So mm-hmm. it's recognized by basically Greece and down. So you have, okay. you know, like Antiochian, which is Syria. You have uh, the, the people in Turkey, et cetera. So like sort of the Greek speaking, that's a, maybe a good way to put it. Okay. Right. So the Greeks, the, the, the churches where uh, there would be Greek services in Greek, as opposed to services in church Slavonic, so which is the Slavic portion of orthodoxy so you have two two major sort of hubs of orthodoxy the greek world and the slavic world that's this is orthodoxy uh there so yes that church is recognized by basically the greek world which is the west right so that greek world is associated with the west nato countries eu countries uh etc so there's this political aspect um in 2018 uh there was basically there was a uh, a synod that was called bishops came together and bishops from the Kiev patriarchate of the uh, Ukrainian Orthodox church, which is really like not kind of recognized. It's not recognized by anybody, but they do have some churches and some monasteries. Um, 
and then the mosque, some from the Moscow Patriarchate, and then some of these other ones said, okay, we're going to be this church. And this is going to be our jurisdiction. We're going to have jurisdiction over Ukraine. We're going to have a patriarch. And the ecumenical patriarch recognized uh, them. Because of that, the Russian patriarch and the ecumenical patriarch um, stopped communion with each other. Hmm. Which basically means that during services, if a patriarch is giving services, there's a, a point where he does his commemorations and he will say all of the other patriarchs' names. And they've stopped saying each other's names. So they stop recognizing them. Wow. Jurisdictionally. Right. So this is a, it's, 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 it's like it has a deep liturgical and kind of um, spiritual meaning that this is happening, but it's also not like permanent necessarily. This is how the church works. These, the church is old, right? This is the ancient mm -hmm. church. It's a decentral, it's decentralized. Okay. So those right. people who are into decentralization know that like, this is how it works when nobody's over anybody else and you have a disagreement about what's going on, this is what happens. So interestingly, most interestingly about the Ukrainian Orthodox Church Moscow Patriarchate is when Russia did their invasion of Ukraine, that church actually broke, or that jurisdiction broke communion with the Moscow Patriarchate, which is kind of weird. It's still being called Moscow Patriarchate, but they've been sort of flying without a patriarch for, for since the invasion, right? Because they're mm -hmm. Ukrainians. So they were like, we don't agree with your stand because the patriarch of Moscow has been very supportive of the military action. Right. Right. And so the metropolitan and everybody underneath were like, no, 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 we're going to cease to recognize sort of your authority in this, in this case, this is our protest. But yet, even though they have sort of not rejected fully, but that they have, you know, nominally broken communion with the Moscow Patriarchate, they are still by the government of Ukraine. So they took a pro-Ukraine stance. But still, but the government of Ukraine is going to ban them. Right? So it, it, it's, it's just re remarkable. And, and kind of... As you've laid this out, you know, these different um, jurisdictions, you know, it'll be interesting to see if this ban does happen, how, you know, the other jurisdictions react, you know, it's well, let's let, well, let's talk about it. We have some historical precedent. Okay, right? so that's what that's what's important about this book. So uh, in the year, like from the year 1721, uh, Russia did not have a patriarch. From 1721 to 1917, uh, Russia didn't have a patriarch. Peter the Great wanted to westernize and modernize Russia. And as part of that, he basically removed the patriarch and started uh, the most holy synod. And so basically what he did was he just took metropolitans, the, the highest metropolitans, mm -hmm. and they were all in a council. Um, and then he's the Tsar. And this carried on for two centuries. Within that council, you had the Metropolitan of Russia, the Metropolitan of Kiev, Novgorod, uh, St. Petersburg, Georgia. They call him the Exarch. So you had all of these different metropolitans, including, again, including Kiev and Moscow, were from 1721 until 1917, Kiev's Metropolitan and Moscow's Metropolitan were equal in the council to the Tsar with the St. Petersburg Metropolitan and all of that. Okay, mm -hmm. so all one church. Just metropolitan, you know, jurisdictions that are different. Right. And all sort of advising, you know, the, the czar. So whether this was a, a, a good decision or not, basically what happened was when the czar was de deposed in 1917, and when... The Bolsheviks came into power. The Synod came together uh, for Russia, and they said, "We have to reestablish the the Patriarchate. We have to reestablish the Moscow Patriarchate because we have no more Tsar, and the Church is going to need protection because these are atheists that are coming into power right now. So we must and and they have they are vehemently anti-Church, right? 
Marx, uh, religion is the opiate of the masses. Mm -hmm. So they're like, we're in danger. Okay, so it's not going to cut it to just have the synod. So Patriarch Tikhon was was chosen. He was actually in America at the uh, at the time, and um, he was brought back. Very pie, holy, holy, holy man, monastic was brought back uh, to act as the defender of the 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 Rus people, basically the, the the defender of the church and the defender of the identity of 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 Russians, and. Uh, you know, he was, he, he, he tried, he fought, um, at the same time that this is going on, that they reestablished the patriarchate of Moscow down in Ukraine. And uh, now Ukraine is fighting for independence because, well, Holy Russia is breaking apart. Uh, eventually, of course, they fall within the Soviet socialist republics, mm -hmm. but there's a power vacuum about wh what are we, are we independent? And at the same time, this is when we first see the Orthodox Church of Ukraine come up. That they say, well, okay, we need to have our own. Moscow just got their patriarch. We need somebody to defend us. So we're going to have our own uh, patriarch as well. Now, what happens, uh, Patriarch Tikhon is fundamentally martyred. Um, a new patriarch is put in by the Bolsheviks, uh, Sergius who is viewed basically as a villain in the church, who pledges basically fealty so how, how to the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks were able to put in a patriarch? How That's did... right. Well, they they if, if you if you read about what they did between 1917 mm -hmm. and 1921 or 1925, um, you know, we talk about the the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Um the real, if, if you want to talk about a 20th century Holocaust, you know, 100 million Christians killed by the Bolsheviks, 100,000 clergy executed, 100,000 clergy executed. The stories of the ways that they were tortured um, and killed is uh, difficult, heart wrenching to even um, read about. Um, it's considered a period of, uh, they're called the new martyrs and pretty much in the Orthodox church, we commemorate them pretty much every day. There's new martyrs that are, are commemorated because there were just so many of them. These are saints. These are saints of the Orthodox church. Um, yes, they, they took over the church, uh, Sergius, you know, they put him in and, and what he said, I think, and 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 who knows what he was motivated by. I think there's a lot of history and people in the church can debate over this. You know, he said, I'm going to try to save the church here. I'm going to try to cut a deal with the Bolsheviks and I'm going to try to save the church. Um, that basically meant a lot of, so there was, there was a break. A lot of people said, we're not going to do this. A lot of priests said, I'm not going to do this. I'm willing to die. Mm -hmm. Many of them did. Um, many went into what they called the catacombs, practicing in secret. You know, for like almost a hundred years, that was the case of the, the the Russian Church. Also, leaving many fled as refugees, and that's why Russian Orthodoxy Orthodoxy spread to the world. It's why one of the reasons why it's in in the U.S. now that we have a Russian Church outside a Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia was because the Bolsheviks uh, did what they did. Um, so Ukraine tried to establish this church. Now, unfortunately, by 1938. When Stalin did his uh, the Great Terror or the Great Purge, 1937, um, that was the end of basically the Orthodox Church anywhere in the Soviet Union. Most so much clergy was killed or imprisoned. Uh, the churches were destroyed, and so there was fundamentally no real church to speak of uh, in the Soviet Union from 1938. You know, besides the Catacomb Church, kind of the hidden church, between 1938 and uh, you know the 1990s. And the church was reconstituted in the 1990s. Now, of course, there was, you know, there was still a succession of patriarchs and bishops. There were still priests being ordained. There were still baptisms happening. But this is happening in a very underground way. Um, so the Ukrainian Orthodox or the the um, Ukrainian Orthodox, no, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. It's hard to keep these keep these in line. The Orthodox <laughs> Church of Ukraine that went that was established in 1921, sort of as a response to the Bolsheviks. To, to the to the fall of of holy russia um by 1938 that was basically destroyed 
Now, the, the current church that is recognized by the Constantinople Patriarchate, they say that they are that. Um, they say that they are the extension of that church, of that jurisdiction. Okay. Um, now, whether that's true or again, like, I, I don't, that's, that's, people can draw the lines of, uh, mm. you know, apostolic secession and the whole nine. And, and perhaps they have, obviously, they must have some claim to that. Um, however, this period, it's important to understand that, like, in the entire Orthodox world, this is viewed, the Bolsheviks, the Soviets is, are viewed as Antichrist. It's really viewed as an end of, as an end of days scenario. Uh, where the church was persecuted at the level of the revelation of St. John. Uh, if you look at, if, you were, if you're there at that time and you're seeing just priests being literally lined up and they're like, sign for the, you know, they line up 50 priests, sign saying that you are in the, the that you are, are, are with Sergius and the church that we've approved. I will not sign. Boom. Sign. I will not sign. Boom. In a line. Like this. Imagine being number 40. You know, this mm -hmm. is the, we don't know about this in the West. We know all yeah, about the not... Holocaust of the Jews. Yeah. We know nothing about this. 100 million Christians. 100 million Christians. It's unfathomable. I mean, that's it's mind blowing. So, so when. So when Russians see, so now, so now you take it to be like, okay, that's the history of the people. So when you're a Russian, right, and you look and you see an atheist government pushing the pushing this woke, you know, which is drawn from out of Marxism, cultural Marxism, mm -hmm. and you see that government trying to take over the Holy Land, fundamentally, you're going to have a certain reaction. And then when you see them say, oh, we're about to ban, that's exactly what the Bolsheviks did. We're about to ban the church. The same church that the Bolsheviks ba banned. The Moscow Patriarchate. You're like, oh, I know who you are. Hello again. So it's time for us to do battle again. Okay, maybe we'll do it a little differently this time. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, it, it when it happened when the when the when the Bolsheviks did it, and you know, terrible tragedy as you outlined, a hundred million Christians dying. But it's interesting how God works in that that was a catalyst, right, yep. for yep. Orthodoxy spreading to the United States and and across the across the world. So. I mean, it's none of us know how how this is going to work out or or what will happen. Um, but you know, you've you've kind of got a reputation for uh, for making predictions and and uh, being pretty pretty accurate for predicting how, how things will yeah, yeah. will play out. How, how do you how do you see this playing out? I mean, I mean, it will. There's no doubt that God will use this and that God is using it. Um, the, I think the first thing is this is brother on brother. You know, this is Orthodox killing Orthodox. And that's the most mm -hmm. important thing, I think, to understand is that there's nothing that the enemy would love more than Orthodox killing Orthodox. There's nothing that the enemy would love more than Christians killing Christians. And and I mean, it, it's I guess it's one thing to be like, oh, well, this is, you know, that happened in Constantinople and there was, you know, Latins, Latins killing Greeks, you know, Orthodox killing uh, Roman Catholics. And it's like, yeah, but these are literally the same church. And like these these are people who for all of them, this is a this is a holy place, I think. You know, in these in these scenarios, the church, I mean, this is when the church shines. I mean, this is when saints are made. It's in these in these scenarios that that martyr in Greek, it means martyr means witness. 
Mm-hmm. Now, that's what it means. It doesn't mean like it doesn't mean you're you're killed. I mean, generally martyrs are are killed because that is the ultimate witness. Um, that is that is proof of them bearing witness that that Christ is king. But this is, I mean, this is the op- the opportunity. So I think that I think that the true battle is being fought is is about to be fought. I think the true battle is about to be fought, and it's the it's it's the church doing what she does. Like it's the church fighting the battle in the way that she fights the battle, and the veil. I think the veil is being it's a revelation. The veil is being ripped mm-hmm. off. You know the 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 positive the the positive. The, so what is my prediction? I uh, my prediction is that. Um, my prediction is that finally the West has an opportunity, and this is the catalyst whereby the West can understand what Christianity actually is and the history of Christianity. Like because you can't you can't tell the story of Christianity without telling the story of of, of the saints of that region. Because like mm-hmm. I say, there have been saints there since the first century. Major saints, martyr, like this is. <laughs> so how can you be a Christian and not know this? Yeah, first, even if first even generation a saints, yeah. first generation, the the first pope besides Peter was martyred there, where this mm-hmm. battle is taking place, and not only was he martyred but converted and baptized. Hundreds of people there. It's not like they left. That's the blood of the people dying on that battlefield. Right. So it's like as Christians. Mm -hmm. And this is this is a Christian history that all Christians share. Right. Right. This is the this is the history that we all share. And so it's like it matters if you're a Christian, this matters. And how how many Christian churches, you know, in the United States, no no matter what denomination are even going to be talking about this, you know, this Sunday, probably. Probably almost none. And that's the key. So this is how you, this so that's the enemy winning. This is the mm-hmm. real battle. The real battle. Because I think we want to understand ourselves as Christians. And I also think that there's a you know, one of the positive one of the positive things that I see happening within, let's say, the libertarian community. Um, is that there is a strong, and it's not just the libertarian community, but I mean, it's even happening with the stuff with Ye and Nick Fuentes, right? Is there is an impulse because our identity, our, this materialist and light and identity since the Enlightenment has clearly it's failed us, right? Mm-hmm. We did a grand experiment as humanity, and over the last three years, we see that failed. Big time. Yeah. So the experiment should be over. Okay. So what is the foundation that we have to sit on? And so if our identity is going to be, if our first and foremost identity, which it should be, is Christians, right? Like that's that has worked. <laughs> it's worked in East and West. It's worked everywhere that it's ever been tried. It's worked. Unlike communism that has failed every everywhere it's been tried, Christianity has worked everywhere mm-hmm. it's been tried. Never fail. Yeah. So if we're gonna do that, if we're gonna be Christians, mm-hmm. like we then we need to recognize like this, what's happening there is part of our history as our spiritual lineage as Christians. It's not just political. In fact, it's not political. If you really understand it, you'll understand it's not political at all. This entire thing is spiritual, and anything that's political is drawn from the spiritual. Yeah, it goes it goes back to to the beginning. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, God gave us free will. Mm-hmm. And if you take that I mean, if you really trace that back and break it down, um that's why evil exists. Mm-hmm. And we have free will to choose between the two. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people will point fingers at Christians at, at God and say, "Well, how can there be a loving God if this, you know, this terrible thing can happen? And you know that kind of gets into, and you know, we don't have to get 
too much into what what Kanye has has said because I think it's it's so nuanced that it's hard to even address it because somebody will will take you out of context. But um, and and it, I, I don't know what's on Kanye's heart or what's in his mind or or, or what he's thinking. But the point that I got from him was really that no matter how how much someone is influenced by that evil. Um, mm -hmm. no matter the atrocities they commit, God still loves them, right? And mm -hmm. that's very difficult to understand. It's not easy to understand. It's hard for me to understand. Um, There's, well, I think that the best, certainly the best way for me to, uh, that, that I've understood it is, and, and something that I recommend to everyone is read the lives of the saints every day. So nothing has been more, I mean, I, you, you, could, you understand where the West went wrong as soon as you read the lives of the saints every day. And it, it's also mm -hmm. been very eye-opening to me because over and over, I mean, literally every day in the lives of the saints. And so what, what, what are we talking about? I mean, we're talking about, well, I mean, we just named one who's commemorated today. So it's like literally from then until, you know, there have been, uh, saints that are canonized within the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's an unbroken tradition. Uh, for, it's, you know, you talk, it's the ancient faith, yes, but like, it's also the modern faith. It's like, it's yeah. one unbroken tradition. And what you see over and over and over again, is you see, especially in the persecutions in like the, the fourth century, um, you know, if you want to change the government, if you want to change the government and you're like, we need to have a Christian government, right? We need to have a Christian government. Over and over and over, the saints change the government. But it's like, how do they change the government? Do they start a political movement? No. Hmm. Do they rally the people in rebellion? No. Do they get arms? No. What do they do? They bear witness. They say they bring this person in. Could just be a, a lay person. Right. They bring this lay person in some woman. Right. And they say. You know, worship the gods, worship our pagan gods. No, I will not. Worship our pagan gods. Do it. You have to do it. It's the law. Sound familiar? Last three years. No, I will not. No, I will not. I refuse. Mm -hmm. OK, then prison for you. OK, then prison and I pray. Then torture for you. OK tortured right and then okay you're done torturing now i will not okay so you're going to be executed and it's in the prison it's in the torture it's in the execution and it's in them saying i will not because jesus christ is real and i have a real relationship with this person and mm -hmm. he is the king that because they do that emperors governors have been have been converted they execute the yeah. person and they're like and they're like whoa they went through all of that everything i could throw at them they went through all oh this jesus christ must actually be real because i wouldn't do that for the pagan gods man that that and is that is converted. such such an incredible point and i mean i, I just had a conversation i'm not going to say anybody's name i've had 50 conversations like this, where you talk to someone on Facebook about Christianity, about religion, and uh, they'll come back and say, well, you know, it's it's just not provable. Ultimately, you know, it's just, it's just an opinion. But you hit the nail on the head there, man. I mean, when you experience a relationship with Jesus Christ, and you see it happen right in front of you, you see changes happen in your life, you see the way that you act, your desires, those things change. And then when you put that on display for other people to watch, when somebody's standing up against somebody facing death and they still don't cave, I mean, that's it, man. That's not, and not only not only not cave, not only not cave, but you know, it's called the crown of we call it the crown of martyrdom. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a crown. It's the greatest. There is no greater thing that you could do with your life than to bear witness to jesus christ as king there's there's not mm -hmm. it's like they go so many times the saints go 
thanking the people who have given them the opportunity. Like, thank you for it because mm. were those, if the torturer and the executioner, you know, doesn't repent for what they've done, that's, that's, they've damned themselves, right? But it's not to say yeah. that they can't because over and over we see with the saints, they do repent. And in some cases, not only do they repent, convert, but then become saints themselves and are martyred. Right. So we see situations where executioners and torturers, because of the experience that they have of, of, of witnessing a martyr, convert themselves and then are tortured and executed themselves, and they themselves become saints. Look at Paul. And this has happened Apostle for 2,000 I mean, the... years. Yeah. Well, we can look at one, or like I say, you could go through the yeah. dozens every day. That's why mm -hmm. reading the lives of the saints is like, yeah, if you just read the, the Bible, the Acts of the Apostles, and you that's all you know, mm -hmm. it's like, wow, that's wonderful. Those were those people then. But then when you're like, oh, 1927 under the Bolsheviks, oh, behave the same way in that situation as this, as someone under the persecution of Diocletian. And you go, mm -hmm. oh, wait a minute. I have not just an icon of this person. I have their photo. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, yeah. this is an unbroken chain. It has never stopped. It's never stopped. And it, it, the battle rages on it. Uh, clearly, it will never stop because we're about to see the same thing in Ukraine. Yeah, and that and that's kind of kind of the one thing where in I don't know how, if you have more time to go a few more I minutes do. here. I do, but, sure, yeah, let's go. Um, you know, you you hear Christians say, you know, with everything happening with with woke culture and you know five year olds being taken to to drag shows by their parents mm -hmm. and all these different things happening, say, well, the the end of days must be coming. It, it must be the end of days soon. And this isn't the first time. This type of stuff has happened. This has happened Not all throughout even, history, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's, it's as a matter of fact, it's, it's tame. What's happening now is tame. Mm -hmm. But but see, people don't people don't know Christian history. This is yeah. what this is one of the this is one of the biggest problems with sola scriptura, right? This is one of the biggest problems with believing that um, everything stopped at the Bible. Right. This is that's yeah. that's a huge you're doing yourself a gigantic disservice in that case, because mm -hmm. it's like, well, Christianity is something that's lived out. And people have been living it out and dying for it for 2000 years. And it's like. You know, this is one of the beautiful things about orthodoxy is that not only are the, that they are commemorated. Right. That the idea is we will remember them. Well, why? Why? Well, you remember them so that when it comes again, you know what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And you have some historical context and you have some spiritual context. Right. And so much so that in the in the Slavic world, uh, you know, certainly in the Slavic Orthodox world, reading the lives of the saints is is uh, in terms of spiritual practice for many and even saints. Uh, many, many saints, modern saints have said that that's as if not more important for a lay person than reading scripture. Wow. As if not more important, you know, St. Nikolai Velimirovich, there's a, this beautiful, uh, people can look it up. Uh, you could probably look up. So Nikolai Velimirovich, if you can't spell that, you could look up. Orthodoxy is a dramatic mystery. It's absolutely beautiful. He's making a comment and he says, uh, and this is a, he's a modern saint, uh, uh, 20th century saint from Serbia, St. Nikolai Velimirovic. And um, he says, many Englishmen comment that the Bible is not regularly read in the home in the Russian Orthodox Church. And he says, this is true. He says, ours is not a book religion. It's not even a learned religion. Ours is a dramatic mystery. Hmm. He says, the Bible is in the hymns. It's in the chants. It's in the incense. It's in the every, it's in the fasts, it's in the feasts, it's it's in the everyday interactions of Orthodox Christians with each other. It's in the architecture of the buildings. It's in the icons. It's in the tradition, and that is to say that it's like it's not dead. It's not dead. It's alive and mm -hmm. living, and the battle is alive and it's raging. And so it's like, 
understand the battle that you're in. Even if you're a Protestant, even if you're a Protestant, the ancient saints are yours still. They're still yours, right? When Martin Luther nailed those, uh, nailed those 95 theses, he, was, he commemorated those saints, those ancient saints, right? St. Clement, he mm -hmm. commemorated St. Clement. So it's like, those are yours. There's so much, there's a thousand years there that even if you're like, ah, these everything, you know, the Roman Catholics and stuff, I don't care about any of that. Yeah, but all that before is still yours. <laughs> it's still yours. Yeah. That's who gave you the book that you've put on the pedestal. That is your thing. The church didn't have that for centuries after the after the death and resurrection of our Lord. There was no yeah. New Testament. It didn't just it didn't just appear right, right you know right after Jesus no. died. Yeah. No, when when Saint Clement, when Saint Clement, uh, you know, was martyred and he converted those people, there was no book. He didn't, he didn't bring a book with him. There was no New Testament. There was no New Testament in the year 100. Mm -hmm. The book that you have now didn't exist. Right? But are you a Christian like St. Clement? Are you a Christian like the first Pope of Rome after Peter? He didn't yeah. have a book. Mm -hmm. He didn't sit around reading that book. Right? But the tradition... The tradition right and that's the tradition that that's the tradition that extends and so i think that it's it's if people want again if you want to be christian like figure out what that means understand yourself in your spiritual lineage right understand what happened after that after the books in that book there's a lot that happened <laughs> the saints didn't stop mm -hmm. it didn't stop the persecutions didn't stop the martyrs didn't stop. You know, whether you're going to venerate them, whether you're going to have icons of them, whether you're even going to call them saints, they were Christians. Yeah. And, and that, they I mean, died for, for their for, faith. For me personally, so yeah, I grew up Protestant, grew up Presbyterian, and uh, I'm non-denominational Christian now. But yeah, it is it is really, you know, fascinating that, yeah, my, you know, my whole journey— you know, learning about Christ in the church, there's saints are not talked about at all, which kind of, you know, the, the in speaking with you now, it seems kind of absurd. I mean, well, it tells th you these something. are stories that can be used, I mean, to, to bring people to Christ. As a, well, it, these are stories to be used to bring you to Christ as a Christian. Mm -hmm. Like, I will tell you that nothing has brought me closer to Christ and helped me to understand what a Christian is more than reading the lives of the saints every day. Nothing. Mm. Nothing. And especially the modern saints, right? Read about. Go now. You don't. Maybe you don't call them saints. You're non-denominational Christian. The listeners out there who are like, ah, oh, that's that saint mm -hmm. stuff. Okay, don't call them saints. Don't call them saints. Just go and read about the new martyrs of Russia. Go and read about yeah, these I will. these these clerics who were tortured and executed, and 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 standing about to be executed said, "Glory to God for all things." Before the bullet went into their skull. And then ask yourself, is that my faith? Is my faith that strong? Mm. Is my faith that strong? And then you should ask yourself, like, ooh, how did their faith get that strong? Wait, what is their relationship with Christ like? And then ask yourself, like, ooh, how did they get that relationship with Christ? Can I have that relationship with Christ? And the answer is yeah. Yeah. And honestly, I mean, some people might be might be scared hearing that. It's kind of strange to kind of strange to say but if you don't have the perspective of Christ's peace in your life well what is this you're supposed to be scared what is that yeah that's an instrument of torture yeah that's an instrument do you i mean some so, people Cyprian, might be scared. Cyprian's well, holding up holding up well, his uh his cross his cross. necklace to yeah. what do you, what do you think it <laughs> what do you think it means to be a christian yeah like you want to you want to imitate Christ, mm -hmm. 
How did his life end? Yeah. And it's like the peace. The peace is that you can go to the cross in peace. The peace is not that you don't go to the cross. The Christian right. life is the Christian life is an orientation towards the cross. What do we look at when we go to church? What are we facing? What are we looking at? What are we oriented toward? Mm -hmm. That what you're oriented toward, when you move forward in life, that is what you reach. So it's like, if, you, if you're not scared, that's the fear of God. If you're not scared, are you a Christian? Do you understand yeah. what you've signed up for? This is what yeah, it means yeah. to be Christian. And if you're unwilling to be Christian, if you're unwilling, he said, take up your cross and follow me. Our Lord said, take up your cross and follow me. Right? He said, take up the instrument of your death, of your martyrdom, and follow me, because that's where mm -hmm. I'm going. I'm going over there. Follow me. Mm -hmm. That's what it means to be a Christian. And if we're willing to live that way, the world can be beautiful. And if we're unwilling to live that way, then the world will be hell, guaranteed. That's how we get to where we are now. Because we're unwilling to take up our cross. We're unwilling to say, no, I will not. That's how we got here. Close the churches. Put on a mask. No more liturgies. Okay, well, the world is going to be hell. Don't trust, don't trust that God, don't trust that God, don't trust that he who heals can heal this situation. Trust the science. Man. Unless you say, no, I will not, then the world will be hell. Yeah. It, it just like just like you talked about at the beginning, um, the next thing will be in, a, in the church. And we're, what, we're not going to trust God to, to heal the world, live in, to keep it so... You know, it doesn't become a, a barren wasteland. Um, yeah, that's what that's that's this yeah. is what this is where we have to have faith. If we if we are going to. Well, it's the, as the psalmist says, put not your trust in princes and sons of men in whom there is no salvation. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the that's it. <laughs> like there is you were being told there's no salvation in these men. And time and time and time again. Those who are like, do not trust the church. Do not trust in Christ. Look at the hell on earth that they've created. Over and over and over again. Yeah. You know, but you wouldn't know that unless you were reading the lives of the saints. <laughs> you wouldn't know that unless you actually knew what it meant to be a Christian. And not in the ancient past, like in the last hundred years in the living memory of people on earth today. Yeah. Right. Well, Vin, Cyprian, you know, I'm, I'm, this has been a, a great, a great conversation, man. And, you know, my, my hope and my prayer is that, you know, this, this has reached someone today. Uh, hopefully it has. And then, you know, also hopefully with what we talked about, with what you talked about for most of the show, um, you know, with what's happening with the uh, the Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine, you know, pr prayers with them, and we'll see where that goes because a lot of uncertainty there. But you know, like we've, I talked think one about, thing people pay attention, right? Like, pay attention to yeah. that part of the story. A lot of people want to pay yeah. attention to the battles and all that type of stuff, but it's like, pay attention. Let's pay attention to that part of the story because that's that's what this is ultimately really all about. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very important for us to put our attention on it. That's a, that's a big help in all of this. Amen to that. Thank you for the, for the time today. Just, uh, if you have anything to plug or anything you want to, uh, let my audience know about, have at it. Well, if, if any of the ideas here about, um, 
you know, orthodoxy or anything like that is interesting to people. Uh, I do a weekly podcast with my spiritual father, Father Turbo Qualls, and also a fellow brother in Christ, Andrew Funk. A lot of people really like it, regardless of uh, even if you're not a Christian, just the spiritual principles that are in there. Um, it's been for me, it's been an education. It's really uh, brought my faith, you know, it's brought me way closer to uh, to Christ in the the basically year that we've been doing it. You can find it uh, just search the Royal Path on YouTube. It's also on Spotify and uh, and on Odyssey. You can find it as well. And um, yeah, I think people will really enjoy it. If you want, basically a kind of a primer on on orthodoxy and the ancient faith, uh, start at the first episodes. We kind of go through, and it's almost a, it's almost an orthodox catechism. So it's that's pretty cool too. If you just want to see what that faith is about, so so that's the royal path. Um, you can YouTube, Odyssey, and Spotify. You can find it. All right. Thank you for coming on the show. And uh, soon. Thanks, John. All right. Thank you guys for listening to that episode. Uh, every time that I listen to a podcast with Vin on the show with Cyprian on the show, um, I learned something. That's if I'm doing interviewing, if I just listen to someone else doing, uh, doing the interviewing. And it, it honestly is a different type of interview uh, because a lot of it is me sitting back and listening, um, trying to, you know, obviously, as I do with all interviews, trying to ask the questions that my audience would ask, but also asking questions, you know, for, for myself, uh, for my own clarity. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Hopefully you learned something. And, uh, you know, I don't know where my listeners are uh, with regards to if you all are, uh, are Christians, where you are on that path. If, you're, if you are or you aren't, you know, that is your personal journey there. That's your personal choice. And uh, I just appreciate the opportunity that uh, you all tuned in and listened to that. And if you're still listening to me right now, um, then you must have enjoyed the show. So if you did, if you did enjoy the show, a great way to support this show, of course, is by subscribing to the show. And you know, I'm trying to grow my, my solo feed, my Finding Freedom solo feed, so you can subscribe there just by typing Finding Freedom, John Odermatt, in whatever podcasting app you're listening on, and you found it here. So I don't have to tell you how to find it. Um, well, I, I should say you might be listening through the lines of Liberty Network feed. So if that's the case, then yes, search that way and uh, subscribe to my solo feed. Great way to support uh, me growing that feed, which is very important, especially for episodes like, like this that I will probably share more so just from my Finding Freedom solo feed and not from the Lions of Liberty Network feed. Now, the Lions of Liberty Network feed also important, and you, sub sub you should subscribe to that as well, um, as well as you should subscribe to Brian McWilliams' Mean Age Daydream feed. So lots of stuff to subscribe to. You don't have to. You can pick whichever one, um, you know, whichever one suits your fancy, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. And, you know, regardless, I am grateful um, for your support. And, you know, I, at the at the top of the show, in the intro, I talked about the Pride special that we have for 15% off to join with an annual membership through Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty. I will have one more plug here. One more plug for our Lions of Liberty store. We do have a holiday section. You can find our, our diehard um, sweatshirt, t-shirt, uh, themed, uh, Christmas <laughs> version, uh, uh, t-shirt you can find in the store. We have a bunch of other, uh, holiday type items. We have beanies and, and things like that. So go to lionsofliberty.store to check that out today. And, you know, as always, we're coming up here on the end of 2022. So a couple more shows left in the new year. Really looking forward to 2023. Brian and I have a lot of great things planned. We're going to be doing a major ad push with Lions of Liberty on other podcast platforms. Really excited to grow this brand, grow this show, and blow this thing up in 2023. So thank you for your continued support. Thank you for sharing this show and all of our shows. And I'm just going to sign off with this, like I always do. Always remember to keep your head up. 
and the fire is liberty burning.